So I have uh, basically the slickest proof I know to convince someone that this really works. Um, and again, it, it involves looking a little bit more at the properties that these kinds of clocks satisfy and what clock arithmetic really looks like. So um, here we did seven, but maybe seven's a little big. Why don't we try the five clock, right? So let's pick you now p equals five instead and talk a little bit about what the multiplication table for five clock would look like. And I'm gonna write it slightly different, right? So on my clock, I prefer the number zero, one, two, three, four instead of one, two, three, four, five. Well, of course, zero times anything is zero, so I can fill in some of these things very quickly. Same thing in the other order. In addition, one times anything, so here my convention is I always do row then column first, so one times anything is uh, the same as I started off with. One times one is one, one times two is two, one times three, and same in the other order. All right, so now we get some more interesting things. Two times two gives me four. Two times three is six. Six on the five clock is one, all right? Two times four is eight. On the five clock, eight is the same thing as three. And I could keep going. Three times two is six again, which is one. Three times three is nine, which is four. Three times four is 12, which is two. Four times two is eight, which is three. Four times three is 12, which is two. Four times four is 16, which is one. All right, so I have this multiplication table for five clock arithmetic. Well, maybe the first thing to notice, this table has the property that's symmetric around the diagonal. If I put a line right here down the middle and I just flip this over, you see that it's the same. And of course, that reflects that if I take numbers a times b is the same as b times a. So this uh, is to say that multiplication is commutative, right? And that was true even before I did it on the clock, so and it remains true afterwards here, okay? Any other thing, special things you see? Well, then any repeats anywhere? We have the silly repeat, so the zeros uh, are repeated in the first row and column. Mm -hmm. But other than that, right, no number shows up twice in any row or column here. Oh, yeah. All I've got is that the rows are just taking one, two, three, four and writing them down in a different order. Yeah. So that's the property that I need, right, um, or one of the two properties that I need, right, to really convince you that the Fermat's little theorem works here. And the fact that it has no repeats again, is because five was a prime, right? So what would it mean for there to be a repeat, right? In a row or a column, let's do the rows, for example, right? Let's say that uh, I had one entry. Maybe we'll check and see that here this was five clock, but I'll show you there's no repeats in the second or the third row for the p clock, right? So if I had two times a number, right? And that happened to be equal to two times another number on the p clock, Right, then uh, that would give me that two k2 minus k1, right, was zero on the p clock. So that means that p has to divide two times k2 minus k1. But again, both of those two numbers are gonna be less than p, right? So p can't divide those, right? So it can't happen, right? So, okay. so no dice, not allowed. Okay. okay? Um, so there's no repeats, so that means that it, it, as long as you're working with clock arithmetic here, there's no repeats in any of the rows or columns. The quick and dirty way to prove Fermat's little theorem, right, is take all of the non-zero things in a, for instance, in a row, and multiply them together, okay? So if I multiply all the non-zero entries in a row, on the one hand, that's going to be, well, let's say we're looking at the eighth row, so I've got a times one, is the first entry that's non-zero, then a times two, a times three, right? And the way I've rigged it, I'll go a times p minus one, right? But there's no repeats, so those are just the numbers one up to p minus one in some other order. And the order of the multiplication doesn't matter. So on the p clock, that's the same thing as just multiplying one up to p minus one again, or p minus one factorial here the same on both sides, right? So on the p clock, I get that, well, there are p minus one terms here, right? If I group all the a's together, on the left side, I get a to the p minus one times p minus one factorial. I've got all the numbers from one to p minus one. And again, over here, I have all the numbers from one to p minus one, all right? And I claim you can just cancel 
the p minus 1 factorials from both sides. Right? And there are several ways to think about that, but maybe a really good way is to say that another thing you might notice about the table is that every row or column has a 1 in it. That's implicit because it had no repeats. Given any number that was non-zero on this list, I can multiply by something else on both sides and it'll just disappear, it'll become a 1. Right? I can cancel it from both sides. This gives me that for any non-zero element a, I have a to the p minus 1 is the same thing as 1 mod p right, on this clock. And so now if I multiply both sides by a, I'll get a to the p is the same thing as a. Um, and if a happens to be p, the statement's pretty silly. right? So then both sides are already multiple of p, so this is just the statement that 0 equals 0. Well, this is the, the easy proof of Fermat's little theorem. OK. That, wasn't, that, that one came later, though. That one came later, yeah. right? So in some sense. Well, right? Certainly the terminology freshman's dream came later than Fermat's little theorem. Yes. Right? But, <laughs> um, but it certainly involves more ideas than the, the Pascal's triangle thing from before.